Thank you. So uh, this talk will be about the uh, Opus Codec, which is um, some form of a follow-up on the Kelt Codec, which uh, Tim Terberry, another um, Opus developer, presented at LCA in uh, 2009. So um, <clears throat> first, what is the Opus Codec? Uh, it's an ITF standard currently under development, nearing the end, hopefully. Um, it targets interactive audio transmission over the internet. Uh, obviously, being at the ITF, we sort of had to focus on the internet. Um, ITF being Internet Engineering Task Force. And um, interactive here means to ha uh, something that is suitable for two-way communication. Obviously, if you can do that, you can also do non-interactive applications, but not the other way around. Um, so Opus aims to be royalty-free, just like Speaks, um, Vorbis, Flack, and all the other ZIF.org codecs. So the code itself is BSD, and there are free licenses to the patents that apply to Opus. So the, the effort involves many organizations, including ZIF.org, Mozilla, Skype, Octasic, and Broadcom. And uh, in terms of technology, Opus is actually a combination of the Silk and the Kelt codecs. So um, <clears throat> just a brief history of where this all comes from. Um, <clears throat> Opus originally comes from two independent efforts. One is the Silk codec that um, <clears throat> Skype started developing in 2007. The other one is the Kelt codec which, um, on which I started in uh, 2007 as uh, some sort of spin-off from the Ghost codec that I was working, with, working on with uh, Monty Montgomery. So a first version was uh, presented uh, by Tim at uh, LCA in 2009, at which point I was saying that <clears throat> we were planning on freezing the bitstream within the next few months. And then um, two months later, <clears throat> Skype came to the ITF and said, well, we would like to create a working group to standardize a free codec. Uh, and they obviously had Silk in mind there. Um, to say that the uh, proposal was controversial would be an understatement. Um, there were big fights over that. Um, as a sort of coincidence, a lot of the people who were opposed to creating such working group uh, tended to work for companies that made huge amounts of money <coughs> with patent licensing on standards codec. I don't know why. And um, <coughs> so it took about a year with a lot of heated debate before the ITF agreed to create um, a working group to uh, do this codec. <clears throat> they weren't allowed to say that it had to be royalty free, but in practice that's what we were doing anyway. Um, <clears throat> so um, shortly after that, July 2010, uh, we had the first prototype of a hybrid codec that combined Silk and Kelt. Um, <clears throat> Then the year after that, uh, we were pretty close to freezing the bitstream, and we had some first listening tests where uh, Opus was actually shown to be able to beat high efficiency AAC and Vorbis, uh, which were not designed for interactive, so that it was quite a surprise for us. And as of November 2011, Opus is said to be uh, in working group last call, and we've been doing the last very minor changes to the bitstream. So let's look at Opus in terms of its main characteristics. Uh, for sampling rate, Opus actually supports uh, 8 to 48 kilohertz, which means anywhere from narrowband, which is what you have with a normal PSTN phone, up to full band, which is what you have on a, C on a CD that you buy. For, uh, in terms of bit rates, it goes from 6 kilobits per second, so about three times as much as Codec 2, but still quite low for everyone else. And <clears throat> it goes all the way up to 510 kilobits per second, which is fairly high and close to the being uh, the rate of the lossless codecs. It supports also variable frame size, which is relatively unusual for speech, for a speech or audio codecs. <clears throat> so you can do very low latency with 2.5 millisecond frames, and it scales up to 20 millisecond frames which are pretty much standard for voice over IP. It supports both mono and video, support for speech and music encoding, 
And what's actually special is that it's possible to change between all of these characteristics seamlessly in real time without having any glitches. So because of all of that, Opus is pretty much suitable for almost all audio applications. So here I've got this figure to show a bit where Opus stands compared to other codecs. Um, <clears throat> what's uh, pretty obvious is in terms of delay on this axis, Opus pretty much has lower, lower or equal delay than any other uh, audio codec out there. So it's uh, pretty good for interactive applications. It also covers the entire range of bitrate. So um, <clears throat> unlike, for, for instance, Speaks, which has also reasonable delay, but um, only goes up to a certain quality because of its limit in bitrate, uh, Vorbis scales a lot in bitrate, but has um, delay that is unsuitable to interactive applications. So Opus can pretty much replace all of these codecs. Uh, for all kinds of applications. So these are just examples of applications um, <clears throat> where Opus is suitable. Uh, voice over IP and video conference, obviously that is the main focus of that codec. Uh, it also works for uh, music and video streaming or storage. There's uh, even some people who have used this codec to do remote jamming. So two people playing an instrument at the same time over an internet connection and being able to synchronize each other. So that requires very low latency. Um, it can work for wireless speakers, microphones. Uh, works for audiobooks. There's uh, some uses as well for virtualization and sound servers. Um, software like NetJack or um, Spice from Red, from Red Hat. Um, so essentially it covers everything except two things. One is lossless like what FLAC does, and the other end is uh, ultra-low bitrate, which is what Codec 2 covers. So these are the two codecs that Opus is not trying to replace. So <clears throat> this is the architecture of the, um, <clears throat> of the Opus codec in terms of the two main components, which are Silk and Kelt. So <clears throat> looking at the encoder, you have a silk encoder that works in parallel with a Kelt encoder. They all output to the same bitstream, and on the decoder end, you have the two parallel decoders. And there's three modes of operation. For speech, up for, for speech from narrowband to wideband, you actually only need the silk part of Opus, so that's the only one that's working. For, on the other end, for music, you only want Kelt. And there's actually a hybrid mode in between that is quite useful, where for very high quality speech, you can use both Silk and Kelt at the same time to get fairly good quality. And the way that works is that Silk for speech is quite efficient at coding up to 8 kilohertz, and then Kelt picks up and codes the remaining frequencies up to 20 kilohertz. So with that, you could actually have very high quality speech at 32 kilobits per second full band. Um, so quickly about the technology on the Silk part, uh, I have not been involved too much in the Silk part of the codex, so I will just have a brief summary of what's involved in there. Um, so Silk is fundamentally a speech codec, so it's based on linear prediction. I would say it's a bit like Speaks, but just much better for every single part of it. Um, so it's very good at coding narrow, both narrowband and wideband speech and it's mostly useful up to about 32 kilobits per second, at which point the quality for speech is very good and um, it doesn't really uh, help to have higher bit rate. Um, <clears throat> it's not very good for music, which is the same for pretty much all of the uh, specialized speech codecs. And uh, it's also actually heavily modified um, compared to the original version that was submitted so that it could fit well within the Opus codec. So it's not compatible with the original Silk codec that currently ships in the Skype client. On the KELT side, uh, so KELT stands for Constrained Energy Lab Transform. Um, it's designed to do both speech and music and it can scale to very low delay. Like most general purpose audio codecs, it's based on the uh, modified discrete cosine transform, or MDCT, just like Vorbis and in some way MP3 and AAC. 
um, it's most efficient on full band signals and its useful range is around 40, kil 40 kilobits per second and above. So in their, in their original form, there was pretty much no overlap between Kelt and Silk. Uh, and on, on the other side of uh, Silk, so it's not, uh, Kelt is actually not very good for low bit, rates, uh, low bit rate speech. So here I have an overview of the um, <coughs> entire Kelt codec with uh, high level blocks. So uh, as I said, it's based on the MDCT. It uses long blocks that can be up to 20 milliseconds in duration. And for <coughs> things like transients, like drums or something like that, or just a new note, then uh, it can actually divide the frames into tiny blocks of 2.5 milliseconds to code that better. So the whole key to the Kelt technology is that it's trying to preserve the energy of each barred band at any given, in any given frame. So no matter what happens or no matter what the bit rate is, Kelt cannot create energy out of nothing in any frequency band or it cannot make any uh, band dis just disappear. And that is very different from codecs like MP3 or even AAC. <coughs> And um, so Kelt makes use of algebraic v uh, vector quantization for all the details within one band. I won't go into the details of that. And uh, because of the uh, low delay constraints, it's actually trying to minimize side information because if you're sending 2.5 millisecond frames, you don't want much side information. Um, <clears throat> so the block diagram here shows the uh, signal going in. It goes through a pre-filter, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, then it, it gets windowed and cut into frames, sent to the uh, forward uh, MDCT. <clears throat> we, from there, we actually measure the energy in each of the bands and we code that explicitly. So in the bit stream, there is something, this is the energy in all of the bands. So that's how the energy is actually preserved. So energy is quantized on one hand, <clears throat> and then it's also used to normalize the uh, MDCT coefficients in each band, and that gets quantized separately. On the decoder end, it's basically the energy multiplies uh, the details that were encoded. We do the inverse transform, we stitch everything back together with uh, weighted overlap add, and then there's a post filter, which I'll also uh, discuss a bit later. <coughs> so this, is, this was from the LCA 2009 presentation. We had a slide on future work, so let's see how that went. <coughs> um, first point was uh, freezing the bitstream format, and although that took a lot more than a few months, that is now done. And <coughs> I'll go into the details of what we actually did to the bitstream. <coughs> so um, first, we did many changes that were required for integration within Opus. Um, Two of these changes, one is um, we had to change the layout of the bands such that we could actually have the same layout for all the frame sizes, which meant we could change frame size on the fly uh, with no glitch or anything. Another change we did was we implemented 20 millisecond frames because Silk used that, so we tried to have some, uh, we needed to have the same frame size. It also had the benefit of increasing the quality because for music, if you have 20 millisecond frames, it's better than 10 milliseconds. Um, another thing we had was um, we did a lot of tuning to the static bit allocation. In Kelt, the, um, one way we reduce the, um, the amount of side information is that the bit allocation is frozen in the bit stream. So we had to tune that because once the bit stream is frozen, you can't change it. And the main change we did was actually stop starving the high frequencies. Um, <clears throat> that required a lot of listening tests to determine that this was actually the problem. So uh, when looking at the bit allocation, in red you have the current bit allocation, which is final. And in blue, this is what we were using in, uh, at the time of the last talk in 2009. So the main difference is that in all of these, this region in frequency, we actually have a lot more bits. So it makes it sound better. And it turned out that this region where we used to have more bits was not really useful, so we moved them around and just increased quality that way. 
Another feature we added was something called anti-collapse, um, which I'm discussing there, here. Um, <coughs> turns out that the way we were chopping the frames into 2.5 millis millisecond small blocks, uh, this was great to avoid pre-echo, uh, but on the other hand, it could cause bands to collapse for short periods of time, like 2.5 milliseconds, and um, <coughs> that could actually be audible. Uh, although not in this room, so I don't have a sample for it. But you can see on the spectrogram here, uh, the x-axis is time, y-axis is frequency. So we see, for example, in this region, this is castanets. So we see that just before one click, we actually have everything collapsing to zero because the energy is very low compared to the, the click and we didn't want to introduce pre-echo. But that black region is actually audible if you have headphones. So what we did to come here with anti-collapse is we actually detected these holes and just filled them with noise. So it sounds a bit strange that we're adding noise as pre-echo, but in practice it turns out that it sounds better. Um, last main change to the bitstream that we did is um, per band time frequency modifications. So it means we could do the equivalent of long blocks and short blocks on a per band basis as opposed to per frame. So <clears throat> here I have um, an illustration of that. So one problem we have is basically we have to choose between having good frequency resolution or good time resolution. So in here, if we have some noise with this resolution, the noise gets spread into, in the time domain, but it's contained in the frequency domain, or we can do the other way. But fundamentally, the product of the time resolution and the frequency resolution cannot be lower than a constant. That is called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and as far as I know, we're just stuck with it. So <clears throat> this is what most codecs actually do, uh, including uh, Vorbis MP3 or AAC. So these, this illustrates three different frames with a transient in the middle. So what will happen is normally we'll use good, we'll want good frequency resolution. When we have a transient, we say for this transient we want good time resolution, and then we go back to good frequency. And um, so what the what Cal can actually do now is that on a per band basis we can decide, well, in this band there's a transient, but we're mostly still hearing the tone from a previous frame. So I, we still want good frequency resolution there. On the other hand, uh, for these bands, there's no tone, so we might as well have good time resolution. So uh, that actually allows us to reduce the artifacts uh, during transients. And this is an actual example of what uh, the encoder currently does on this uh, audio sample. So uh, we can actually hear some guitar playing at the same time as hand claps. So, oops. Yep. <clears throat> so most of the spectrum is actually green, so we have good frequency resolution. And when we have hand claps, then we see this red. But the red does not necessarily extend all the way down, for example, here. So we can still properly encode the tones um, even during the hand claps. So uh, that was for the bitstream. And then uh, one other point uh, that was in our future work was dynamic rate allocation. And that was also done. In terms of dynamic rate allocation, so as I said earlier, Kelt mostly has static allocation. And that's the only thing we had in, back in 2009. And although that's been tuned, we can do a bit better. And now there's actually two ways to deviate from that static allocation. One is what we call the allocation tilt, which basically controls the balance between the bits we give to the high frequencies versus the low frequencies. Uh, so that gives us a bit of uh, control over that. And there's also <coughs> um, what we call a band boost, which means we can actually say that this particular band needs more bits. So we added something to the bitstream to just boost the allocation on a per band basis. Um, <coughs> We're still working on how to efficiently use that method, but at least uh, we've frozen the bitstream in a way where we know that we can make a better encoder in the future. Uh, there's still some work in progress for um, 
using this uh, band boost uh, technique. So that was for dynamic allocation. Uh, we had uh, improved stereo coupling, and that was done as well. Um, for stereo coupling, now op uh, Opus, or the Keld mode of Opus, has three modes now. One is dual stereo, so coding left and right separately. Not very interesting, but sometimes useful. Um, we have mid-side stereo, which is really the interesting one. And there's intensity stereo where we don't have too many bits, so we just down mix to mono and encode the energy difference between the channels. So uh, for mid-side stereo, what we do is the, um, so it's mid-side means some indifference between the two channels. And we do that after having normalized by the energy, which means that no matter what happens or if we mess things up in the mid-side, we still have not modified the energy so we cannot add crosstalk or create really bad artifacts. So that makes the technique fairly safe. And again, stereo not in the world. Uh, it can be used for both. Okay, so there's still enough phase information there. Oh yeah, we do, pr we, the question is, is there still phase information? And except for intensity stereo, we fully preserve the phase there. Okay. Uh, we're just talking here about uh, reducing the bit rate by taking advantage of the redundancy between the channels. Um, and so the way we do it, again, is we preserve the ratio of energy between the sum and the difference, which we encode as an angle here. Um, that turns out to be optimal in terms of quality, and I won't go into the maths to prove that. And um, the only important thing to know is the bit allocation for mid and side actually depends on this ratio. And um, it also turned out that what we did for uh, mid-side stereo turned out to be v a very useful way to split some bands that were previously taking too many bits um, because our code books have a limitation of 32 bits if we don't want to require 64-bit arithmetic. So if we have code books that are too big, we split the band into pretend it's, it's uh, mid-side stereo and then recursively do that, and we can uh, actually encode up to um, uh, code books up to uh, uh, 1,024 bits with just uh, this kind of split. So that was for stereo coupling, and last one was improving the pitch prediction, which was not very good. And on that one, help actually came from uh, Raymond Chen, who works for Broadcom. And what he proposed was to replace our current pitch predictor by um, what he called the pre-filter post-filter that is mainly aimed at doing noise shaping. So the important part is if you look at the frequency response of the post-filter here, this assumes that we have some, uh, sig a signal that is periodic. Whoops. So our signal will have um, a tone at this frequency, this frequency, and so on. So what the pulse filter will do is if we apply it on the decoded signal, then it will, assuming the noise before it is, no, is sort of flat, spectrally flat, it means that we're emphasizing the noise that is close to the tones we have where it's not really perceivable and we're reducing it in between the tones where it would normally be audible. So by doing that, then the total amount of noise we perceive goes down. And the idea of the pre-filter is only because the post-filter modifies the frequency response, so we need to have the opposite on the encoder side to make sure that the total frequency response of the system is still flat. So we did some subjective testing of the Opus codec. We compared it to several other codecs, including the AMR codec, Speaks of Orbis, and some flavors of AAC. Um, we did many tests during the development, and on the final version, uh, what we have are seven tests that were actually conducted by Google. We had two MOS tests uh, that were uh, done by Nokia, and we have um, one ABCHR test from uh, some volunteers at Hydrogen Audio, which is an audio en enthusiast website. So first, the Google tests. Uh, they were narrowband. <coughs> there were two narrowband tests, one for English, one for Mandarin. 
And what the te these tests showed was that Opus was clearly better than both uh, Speaks and ILBC for narrowband. Um, it was also better than AMR wideband, uh, sorry, AMR narrowband at 12 kilobits per second. We'll see that's not the case for lower bit rates. Um, in wideband and full band, um, Opus was found to be much better than Speaks G722.1, also called Siren, and also G719, which is one of the recent ITU standards. It was also found to be better than AMR wideband at 20 kilobits per second. Again, not the same for low frequencies, uh, for low bit rates. Um, <clears throat> on a music test, uh, Opus 64 actually had about the same quality as MP3 at 96. So um, <clears throat> we're actually much better than MP3 there. And the test was inconclusive uh, when it came to AAC that was within the margin of error. And um, there were also some transcoding tests and just found that there were no issue transcoding between Opus and AMR narrowband or wideband. So this here is uh, the average of the clean and noisy tests that were done by Ansi Ramo from Nokia. <clears throat> what these tests showed was that compared to AMR narrowband here and AMR wideband, uh, Opus, which is represented by these uh, the yellow and the two red lines, depending on the mode. Um, so Opus essentially does better than these uh, ITU or 3GPP codecs at higher rates, and it does a bit worse at lower rates, which we didn't care too much about for voice over IP, so that's not a big loss. Um, and at, at higher bit rate, it's actually fairly competitive with uh, G718B, which is a very new ITU um, standard, and it's better than these two other ITU codecs, uh, which are 722.1C, called Siren 14, and uh, G729. Uh, sorry, uh, G719. Yeah, it's much better than G729 <laughs> there. Um, and this last test was from um, <coughs> uh, done by some volunteers at Hydrogen Audio. Uh, it's a, um, it was a 64 kilobits per second test on uh, stereo music, and it turned out that Opus was found to be um, significantly better than uh, the high efficiency AAC implementation from Apple, which itself was better than both the Nero implementation of high efficiency AAC and Vorbis, and these two were actually statistically tied. So that was actually quite a surprise because high efficiency AAC has a latency in the order of 200 milliseconds and we were operating at around uh, 20 milliseconds latency. <clears throat> so I have a few samples here um, <clears throat> to give an idea of the kind of quality. So the first one is what <clears throat> you might be hearing when um, <clears throat> someone puts you on hold using a regular PSTN phone. So this is what you would be hearing. <laughs> So th this is what telephony people called uncompressed speech. Now with exactly the same bit rate, which is 64 kilobits per second, with Opus you could actually do full band stereo, which means you would get this instead. And this here is the reference. I'm not sure you can actually hear the difference with the... Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I'm not sure you'll be able to hear the difference between Opus and the reference uh, in this room, but this is the reference. There's a bit more noise, but the dynamic range should be the same. And this is actually what you get at, with MP3 at the same rate. So, yeah, MP3 sort of breaks down at those kinds of rates. Um, so, I also have a demo to show how Op Opus can actually change its bit rate on the fly. So, in here, I, what I have is the same excerpts, but it 
changes bit rate continuously. It starts at 8 kilobits per second and it goes all the way up to 64. And that is illustrated in the bar here. So it starts at 8 and I'll play this. So this is really an extreme example. Normal, in a normal internet connection, the uh, bandwidth tend to not go up by a factor of 8 in 15 seconds. But uh, this just demonstrates that it's fairly easy to change the, uh, change the bit rate in real time and not have any, um, any sort of glitch or anything. So uh, this is what we're currently working on. Um, on the tool side, we're working on an, um, <coughs> on an AUG encoder and decoder. We've pretty much settled the um, exact format to um, uh, use the AUG container with Opus. Uh, we're working on a Matroska encoder decoder. Um, there's uh, hopefully Firefox support uh, coming along. We still need to decide on which container that would be. And um, so that's on the tool side. In terms of quality improvements, there's still a lot of uh, quality improvements possible because so far we've only focused on the quality aspects that related to the bitstream. Now that the bitstream is frozen, we can actually work on having a good encoder. Um, <clears throat> so right now we're working on having better uh, uh, encoder decisions, so really tuning the encoder to increase the quality. Um, also working on the VBR side because um, what we had uh, even in the um, hydrogen audio test was VBR that was heavily constrained. It could not deviate too much from its uh, average rate. And now we're working on a way to have uh, the Opus encoder being allowed to use a lot more bits on audio contents that it knows is much harder for it to code. Um, and the last one is uh, automatic speech and music detection. So we could use the optimal mode if we have speak. If we have speech, we may want to use Silk uh, a lot more than if we have music. So um, it's much better if we can detect that automatically than asking the user. And. Um, Here's what's the non-technical stuff coming up. Um, on the IETF side, uh, the next step is uh, to go to IETF last call. Um, hopefully that should happen in the next few weeks. And after that, the next step is we have an uh, actual Opus RFC. In terms of in in industry adoption, uh, the, main, uh, the main place where uh, Opus we're really hoping will get adopted is for the upcoming RTC web standard, or WebRTC. Um, the idea of that is to standardize video conference or uh, voice over IP from within the browser. Um, there's also browser support uh, for HTML5 audio tags. That would be fairly nice. Um, also, well, that's not free software, but uh, considering that Skype is involved, most likely their, um, the Skype client will probably be shipping that at some point. And in the future, I think everyone should be using Opus, um, except the ones using Codec2 and Flack. <laughs> so here's our website. Um, <clears throat> we've got a Git repository, uh, ITF mailing list. There should be a more technical list created shortly. And we're always on hash opus on uh, the on the freenode.net. Any questions? We have time for about fifteen minutes of questions, if that's okay. Oh. Just on the um, the the world domination point, but I mean we've had terrible poor luck with getting anywhere with free codex outside our little community. Um, YouTube perhaps being one of the few examples where I can play something with a free codec. How do you see that changing? What, what, what's, uh, do you, you see that your codec's so much better that you'll be able to get picked up? I mean, how do you work through the world's MP3 players or those other things that may wish to, that could really benefit from a better, from these better and free codecs, yeah. but we seem to be stuck in the poor choice that we made 10 years ago from what we could pick up off the floor of MPEG? So 
obviously there's no guarantee that everyone will be using it, but there's many things that are actually different this time. Um, one is that we're actually in a standards organization, which is the IETF, and one thing that a lot of people used as a reason not to use Speaks or Vorbis was that, well, it's not really a standard, it's just this ziv.org weird people that are handling that. So that obviously changes. We actually do have support for, from many companies who actually want to deploy this, so we're not just uh, trying to push it. There's many people who want to use it, including for this WebRTC thing. And um, in general, Opus does a bunch of things that no other codec can do. So we're not, uh, we're probably not going to be uh, pushing away, for instance, G729 in the applications where it's currently being used. However, for new applications, and there's a lot of them right now, and uh, there's lots of applications where there's no other codec that works. So, um, or there's no other really strongly established standard. So this should be easier than um, trying to push um, Proprietary, uh, royalty bearing things into into new spaces. You're hoping yeah. that someone will just pick up all this works, and I'm not not writing a check. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're not going to replace MP3 overnight, no. but there's a large space of applications where we could just go in because there's no strong com competition at this point. Mm. Uh, some bitrate questions. I wondered, when you played the bitrate sweep, it seemed like there was a very noticeable shelf at about between 30, 35 or so, where just all of a sudden all of the high tones were no longer as muted. Was that it switching modes or something else? Yes, what, what happens basically is that uh, what you were hearing at eight kilobits per second, only because of the bitrate, uh, Opus was actually coded, coding the audio only up to four kilobits, uh, sorry, up to four kilohertz, and it was down mixing to mono. Otherwise, the artifacts would be uh, there would be just too much artifacts. And as the bit rate went up, then the bandwidth got wider. <coughs> um, around 30 something, it went to full band. Around 40, it switches from mono to stereo. So some, in some of the places, the difference is quite large, so that's what you hear. Um, in a normal application, that would not happen very fre frequently to hit these, uh, these transitions. And do you have a constant bitrate mode or some simulation of one to handle the case of encrypted audio safely? Uh, I'll, uh, this, in some sense, is two different questions. Uh, so first, uh, yes, we do have a pure constant bit rate. We have a <coughs> constrained variable bit rate, and we have fully variable. Uh, the second comment I'd like to make is that the whole thing about encryption and VBR is, uh, in the vast majority of applications, really blown out of proportion. But we still support CBR. Yeah. Um, so I guess. I, I mean, am I looking at encoding my entire CD collection again in um, Opus? Is it, how does it, so really, how does it perform uh, at the kind of bit rates that I've been using for OG currently? Is, is that, have you testing stuff for that? Yeah, so we haven't done much testing at higher bit rates. Uh, one of the, the only real comparison we did was 64 kilobits per second. Um, I expect the difference to be smaller for higher bit rates. Uh, it's actually very hard to test. Uh, we're about to start a test with the hydrogen audio folks at 96 kilobits per second. And above that, the differences become so subtle that it's really hard to get statistically significant results. In the end, especially for the, the, uh, these kinds of high rates, you're not likely to see a huge difference between Opus and Vorbis either way. So. If you're going to be re-encoding your music collection with Opus, it would not be for quality reasons. Maybe at some point, if you know browsers get Opus support, then you know that could be worth it. But it, it, there's no like really big difference with uh, Vorbis, uh, unless you go to lower bit rates and speech and things like that, where Opus is much better. So. Um Quick one: How would you characterize the CPU complexity for encode and decode, with in terms of MP3, Vorbis AAC level? 
Um, so for decoding, I would say that Opus is probably slightly more complex than Vorbis. On the encode side, there's actually a huge variability. There's, uh, there's a complexity knob that can be tuned to say I want higher quality at the price of more CPU or lower. Um, in, actually for music where you're only using the Celt mode, which is less complex than the Silk mode, uh, the, uh, o the complete Opus encoder will likely be much less complex than the Vorbis encoder. And there's actually a fixed point, um, there's a fixed point encoder and decoder for Opus. So it can actually run in real time on vast majority of the embedded devices now. I'm not sure whether you see um, potential, but in cases where it might be possible to do multiple passes of an audio stream to him, could you see improvements that you could do with the variable bit rate encoding, if you can do multiple passes? Um, right now, not that much. Um, there may be some code that could be added for that, but the, the work we're currently doing in terms of VBR is to actually say, this is sort of this is the quality that I want, and use whatever bit rate you think you need for this file. So we can end up with uh, if we use really fully unconstrained VBR right now, uh, which is only experimental. We can and we ask for 64 kilobits per second. Um, many files will end up like at 60 kilobits per second, and once in a while you'll have one file that goes to 100 or something like that because it was just much harder to code. So it'll. Over a music collection, it'll average to 64, but there can be large uh, variability. Obviously, if you're doing anything real time, then you want the constrained VBR that does not do that. Um, I noticed that in the API. Oh, oh okay, sorry. <laughs> um, you only could use uh, one or two channels, and also bit rates were quite. Um, only had a very limited selection. Um, is that something inherent in the codec or that will change in future? Uh, so is what uh, inherent to the codec? Uh, I um, the, 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 you've got the sample rates as like a, a, about a set of four or five different ones, and there's only one or two channels um, for something like uh, video streaming of like an actual movie, say from Netflix, Hulu, or whatever. Um, you might have, you might want actually multi-channel audio. Is that something that you can do with the codec? Yeah. Okay. So th th there's two uh, two independent issues there. Uh, in terms of sampling rates, the sampling rate that the current API will take are 8, 12, 16, 24, and 48. For different sampling rates, you just Sorry, use... Re there's no 44.1 for CD quality? Uh, CD. For, for that, you actually want to use resampling. And the, for example, the AUG encoder we have right now will just transparently resample to 48. And if you decode, it will resample back, and that's really not, not an issue. It makes things a lot simpler, and it, uh, that's part of what allows us this great flexibility and frame size and all of that. Um, in terms of number of channels, the low-level encoder only does mono and stereo. However, um, in, for example, in the AUG mapping, and that can be done in Metroska and everything else, we can support multi-channel simply by encoding multiple mono or stereo streams. For example, you would probably want to couple the left and the right with, and also couple the rear left, the rear right, and then maybe have the center being independent. And you, we define how to put that all together in a single packet. So that's how you would do multi-channel with uh, Opus. Uh, my question to do with the speech codec. Um, have you stopped work on that now? Are we going to see a sort of a 1.2 stable release? And uh, is it just going to drop <coughs> off and Opus will take over? Um, yeah, so I'd like to really apologize for the lack of maintenance on the speak side. Um, <clears throat> what is currently called 1.2 RC1 would normally have been 1.2 if not for the other DSP stuff like the noise reduction and all that that wasn't quite ready for prime time. So um, <clears throat> I meant to actually split that to get together and call the codec part 1.2. Uh, don't actually expect much change on, on that side. Um, even the DSP stuff is not nearly as good as what Google uh, released in its um, WebRTC uh, code base. Um, so there probably needs to be a bit more maintenance. And if anyone knows of a maintainer who would be interested, that's possibly something that could be arranged also to get better support. Sorry about that. Um, I'm curious, where does the modern um, audio codec developer get a psychoacoustic model these days? 
Uh, I don't know. Opus has no psychoacoustic model, or at least none that looks even remotely what uh, is in uh, MP3, and I don't know what AAC does. Um, we ended up figuring out that a lot of the really fancy psychoacoustic curves and all that is actually not that useful once you do the basics, which is um, constraining the energy in each band and having a decent rate allocation. Um, a lot of the fancy stuff was just not useful, at least not for, for Kelt. Are there any other questions? In which case, uh, please allow us to thank uh, you with this uh, gift from Linux Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you.